right. Yes. Cool. So, um, so as as I said, uh, Joshua will um, you know take us all through PLOOKUP later, and so um, that'll be exciting. Uh, like, so we'll talk a little bit and have a, a really cool um, a live demonstration. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with with a, a non zk related uh, cryptography topic, um, but one that I'm sure will still be of interest to um, many of you here. Um, just go over uh, um, um, this project that we call Fervio, um, which is in collaboration uh, with Osmosis Labs. Um, uh, it's a um, great collaboration that we've had with them. And um, uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, okay. Just having a little technical issue. All right. There we go. Uh, you can follow along uh, because it's a uh, hack and D slides. Uh, you can follow along with this link um, and you can uh, browse the slides at your own pace. Um, although um, the tech, most of the technical uh, details about Fervio will be released in a technical paper uh, relatively soon um, that we're uh, currently preparing that will have all of the uh, nice uh, math and proofs and other details that um, will be very interesting. But for right now, uh, I want to go through the high level overview of what we're trying to do and the, some of the des design decisions that we've made. Okay, so what is Fervio? Well, there's this problem that blockchains have, uh, have uh, uh, encountered, uh, especially um, uh, as more and more finance applications move on to the blockchain. Um, this problem of minor extractable value, uh, or MEV. And uh, the idea of uh, minor extractable value, which um, is uh, perhaps a little bit of a, um, um, a misnomer because uh, it's not just miners that can um, extract value in this way, but uh, pretty much anyone who has um, some kind of advantageous position on the network um, where they can uh, control in some way um, how transactions are uh, executed on the network, um, including um, uh, putting their transactions ahead of other people's in a um, way that can uh, be called front running, um, censoring transactions, reordering transactions to um, um, be more advantageous to the uh, uh, miner or validator. Um, in many cases, uh, uh, in fact, these uh, in, uh, entities don't actually have any kind of um, um, formal role in the network, but uh, nevertheless, they have, uh, um, you know, better connections and um, are able to monitor the mempool uh, for incoming transactions or that kind of thing. And um, they're able to, uh, because of uh, whatever advantages that they have, um, be able to uh, uh, change how the transactions are executed um, and, and uh, extract some value. And in cases of, of uh, like front running, um, this uh, sort of lowers the utility of the network. It makes it less useful for other people um, because uh, if, they're, uh, if other people are trying to do you know, their trades in the network, um, but they get, keep getting front run uh, and extracting some of the value of these trades, then there's not as much uh, usefulness of this network for those traders. So um, is, there's some great articles on this, um, some technical research by this Flashbots group, um, and some amazing um, articles on the, uh, the concept of a deep forest, um, which, which I encourage you to read, but um, many of you may already be familiar with. Um, and, and uh, you know, solving this uh, issue or, or, or addressing this issue of minor extractable value is um, going to be important for blockchains going forward. Okay, so uh, what, what can we do about it? Like um, uh, blockchains are very public, um, at least um, if, if we're not in the uh, zero knowledge uh, area, um, you know, transactions come in, they're public, um, uh, they have to be publicly executed. So what can you do? Well, the most uh, important thing you can possibly do is to at least not reveal the content of the transactions until 
they're actually included in a block. Um, and the block is committed and the ordering of the transactions are committed. Only then do you want to reveal what the uh, content of the transactions uh, actually were. Because that way, um, when the block is being constructed, um, no one can um, uh, use their knowledge of uh, the transaction that was submitted to uh, put their transactions in front or sandwich the transactions or uh, in other ways um, alter the order of how the transactions are executed. And so uh, broadly, um, I think uh, people have uh, looked at minor extractable value and said, okay, this uh, tr trying to prevent the content of the transaction from being revealed um, is, is the important part. Um, however, uh, the details of how to actually do this are not necessarily so straightforward. Um, uh, and there's actually uh, you know, several different kind of uh, theoretical approaches which um, people have looked into. Um, one uh, very popular uh, idea of how, how to address this is uh, using some kind of time lock encryption, um, usually, uh, but maybe not always, uh, based off of uh, something like verifiable delay functions, where the idea is that um, you lock your uh, uh, transactions in this time lock encryption, um, and you encrypt your transactions to say, well, I can only, uh, I will want the these transactions to only be able to be decrypted, uh, say, uh, one minute from now. And the hope being that uh, in that one minute time, they will be included in the blockchain and, um, you know, committed to. And then uh, once the time lock is opened, um, um, the transactions will execute uh, in the order that they uh, have appeared in the blockchain. And um, in some ways, this is a good approach. Um, it's certainly um, sort of very compatible with the uh, notions of, of how proof of work blockchains work. Um, uh, there's some um, tricky things in terms of how to get the actual timing to work out the way that you want them to. Um, and also, uh, certainly in, in um, some applications, uh, um, uh, having a delay in execution is, is uh, not so convenient as well. Um, you don't, you know, you want your uh, time lock to last long enough to make sure that your transaction gets executed um, um, without being front run, but uh, you also don't want your transaction locked for too long. Um, otherwise, it, it might become stale or, or it might not uh, execute at, um, in the way that you want to. Um, so a different way of, of doing it, which is the way that uh, we've gone with Fervio, is to use something called threshold decryption, where um, um, unlike time lock encryption, which is uh, based off of encrypting um, to some future time, uh, threshold decryption is this idea of uh, decrypting via uh, some committee or some group of, of, of uh, entities um, that are able to decrypt. Um, and there was a great uh, talk by uh, uh, Sunny a couple um, weeks ago on uh, um, uh, uh, um, these various trade-offs and um, these different approaches that can be used for, for preventing minor extractable value, um, which, which uh, you can go watch his talk. And it's, it's really great. Um, but uh, uh, I won't further into the trade-offs here and just describe uh, how do we actually accomplish this with Fermio. So with threshold decryption, um, if you're familiar with you know, standard public key cryptography, uh, where um, you know, a message is encrypted to a public key and then whoever possesses the private key can decrypt them. Um, with the threshold decryption system, uh, it works very similar. You have a single public key that's available to everyone, it's public, um, and it's broadcast on the blockchain or, or, or gossiped in some way so that everyone has it. And uh, messages, which in this case are, are essentially transactions, um, can be encrypted to this uh, single public key. But the difference is that no one actually knows the private key. Uh, the, the private key that's associated with this public key um, um, is not possessed by anyone in, in the world. Um, but instead, in different parties own uh, what we'll call private key shares. Um, with, uh, 
which are um, we've kind of partitioned up this private key in 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 um, some way so that every subset of at least t parties can decrypt the message, while every subset of at most t minus one parties cannot decrypt the message. And um, this is related to something called uh, Shamir secret sharing. If you're familiar with with that, um, the idea of how uh, um, and parties can share uh, a general kind of secret um, such that at least um, every subset of at least T parties can uh, reconstruct the secret while every subset of at least uh, of at most T minus one parties cannot reconstruct the secret. And the basic concept is the same except that instead of uh, reconstructing the private key, which would reveal to everyone what the private key was, um, parties are, are not going to reveal the private key, they're instead going to decrypt this message. And these parameters are, are uh, very adjustable. So like, um, so in the threshold decryption system, you can choose these values of T and N, where um, if you have uh, N different parties and you want, um, say, uh, two thirds of them to be able to decrypt, then you can choose T equals um, two thirds of N, right? So, Threshold decryption is something that we can build uh, on top of, of uh, secret sharing. Um, and it's been known for, for many, many years that you can, and um, there's been many different constructions for how to build threshold uh, decryption crypto systems. Uh, although I'm not um, sure that there's actually been uh, um, very many applications deployed that actually use threshold decryption. Okay. so. Threshold decryption um, um, as a cryptographic concept is, is well established. Um, but one reason why it's um, uh, you know, verifiable delay functions are, are a little bit newer um, sort of uh, came up in the blockchain uh, context first. Um, but in the uh, um, uh, Threshold cryptography is actually very useful depending on the kind of blockchain that you're uh, building it on top of. Uh, so in a BFT, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus uh, based blockchain, uh, such as, for example, those that are built on Tendermint um, or the Tendermint proof of stake protocol, um, there's actually a very nice natural correspondence between um, who owns a stake in the network or, or who has uh, been delegated the stake in the network and who should own these private key shares. So in the Tendermint proof of stake system, um, validators are delegated weight by uh, um, you know, people who own uh, the staking token in the network and uh, validators can produce blocks by uh, voting using the stake and more than two thirds weight by stake uh, when they vote to commit a block, that causes the, the um, block to get committed um, and uh, yeah, the transactions in it um, join the blockchain, right? And so um, at least uh, sort of qualitatively, um, you have this very, very natural correspondence. The validators, which already have been delegated this uh, stake in the network, this authority in the network, to say, okay, if some threshold of stake has voted to commit these blocks, um, then the, uh, the blocks become finalized and uh, um, you know, the blockchain uh, progresses forward. Uh, and so it's very, very natural now to say that um, these validators should also have these private key shares and be able to decrypt these transactions um, subject to the same two thirds weight uh, threshold. Um, and so this, this makes, um, um, using threshold decryption uh, in this proof of stake world, a lot um, uh, sort of a, a lot more of a natural choice than um, maybe using uh, time lock encryption. So here's the basic idea of how uh, we want the uh, transaction model to look like. Um, validators are going to generate a common public key in some way, a single public key that everyone uh, using the blockchain should know. Um, this public key gets broadcasted in some way. Um, Alice wants to do some kind of transaction, so she 
uh, builds the transaction um, in the way that um, you know she has her wallet software that builds her transaction for her. Um, and the wallet is going to encrypt her transaction um, to this public key. So she encrypts the transaction so that no one can uh, uh, know what's uh, contained in this transaction, um, but uh, presumably uh, it can be decrypted later at some point. Um, so once Alice broadcasts her encrypted transaction, uh, validators are going to get this uh, encrypted transaction in the mempool and validators are going to include uh, this encrypted transaction eventually in a block. Um, you know, uh, validators, because they have no idea what's in the uh, transaction, um, are going to have to, uh, you know, use just uh, what little information they have to decide, um, you know, when and how to include Alice's uh, transaction. So maybe she's included the gas amount and the fees and that sort of thing. But Otherwise, uh, no one can actually tell um, what her transaction is or what kind of uh, um, uh, transaction she might be doing. And therefore, it makes it much more difficult to uh, front run or um, get MEV from. Um, and so validators are going to include Alice's encrypted transaction in the block. Um, Whoever is constructing the next block, because in, in um, the Tendermint proof of stake, this is very... Um, sort of well described, like well specified uh, about how blocks are, are proposed and um, um, voted on. Um, so whoever the block proposer is will scoop up a bunch of transactions from the mempool, add it to a block, and then um, uh, the network will come to consensus on that block. And what we want to happen is that uh, when the validators are voting on this block to decide whether to commit to it, um, they should be uh, committing with their uh, decryption shares of Alice's transaction, but all pretty essentially uh, the decryption shares of every transaction in this block. Um, but the idea is that um, we want to make sure that uh, um, the exact moment when two thirds uh, of uh, stake is voting for this block, that uh, two thirds of the um, Pub, uh, private key shares are also voting for this block. And therefore, um, as soon as you reach this two-thirds threshold, uh, the block is finalized, um, and you also have enough decryption shares to actually decrypt Alice's tran transaction and execute it. So that's the model that we're trying to get to. Now, there's some difficulties that happen um, when you try and actually implement this. Uh, the biggest difficulty is that, um, well, validators uh, have different amounts of stake. And in general, um, you know, you, you might hope that uh, every validator has about the equal amount of weight because that's good for decentralization of the network um, and, and other reasons, but um, in practice, of course, this is not how it works. Um, uh, validators tend to be very top heavy, um, and a couple of validators tend to have a lot of weight. Um, and so two thirds by count of validators is not generally going to be equal to two thirds by stick. Like even in a really great world where validators have roughly equal kind of stake, um, you're, you're not necessarily going to have this exact uh, equality. Um, and so uh, if we, want to achieve our ideal outcome where the validator can finalize a block if and only if they can decrypt all the transactions in the block, well, then, um, you know, we need to do some, some adjustment there. We need to, uh, we, we, you know, that's the outcome we want to get, but uh, we can't just give one uh, private key share to each validator. So the only really reasonable way to do this is by uh, weighting the private key shares. Uh, namely, um, you have more private key shares than you have validators, and higher stake validators get more private key shares. Um, and you know, if you have uh, 100 validators, for example, uh, you might want to give 2,000 or 4,000 or even 8,000 key shares out, and uh, this will let you approximate the uh, um, amount of stake that all the validators have in the network. Now, 
because we're now making a number of private shares, um, um, private key shares uh, in the protocol much, much larger, um, you know, uh, there's a big difference between, it, say, n equals 100 and n equals 8,000. Um, the uh, immediate thing that this enforces is that um, every uh, um, part of this protocol now must be uh, big O of n log n in performance in both uh, uh, network bandwidth and computation, um, which uh, the, otherwise, the scaling is just too bad. Um, it has to be uh, at least this kind of quasi-linear scaling. Um, and the reason uh, that I point this out as being really important is because it's not necessarily obvious how to achieve this. Because remember, if you have n different parties, um, the communication complexity pairwise is uh, n squared. So if you're sending a message between every pair, of entities in, uh, in the network, um, and you have n entities, then um, you have n squared messages, right? And so this is uh, in in general, and, and then if you must do, uh, if every entity must do uh, some computation um, from each uh, on the data they receive from every other entity, then it very it can very easily become, um, um, you know. Uh, big O of n squared bandwidth and computation. And um, in fact, this is kind of just a general issue with distributed systems um, in general, and, but it just becomes um, kind of even more acute here because um, we are sort of uh, decoupling um, um, the uh, number of validators or number of entities in the network and the number of private key shares, which is now much larger. And so, uh, with everything that we do, we have to focus on keeping this performance um, much better. So um, the first part of this, uh, of, of Fervio is, um, so we need to um, have the validators be able to create this private key where um, uh, the private key is distributed around to all, uh, the private key shares are distributed around to all the validators but no one actually knows what the private key is. Um, it's very much like a trusted setup in the ZK um, world, um, right? And so um, uh, I won't go into the details of how, this, how, how we do this. There's some really great papers that describe the technical details uh, much better, but um, the basic design decisions that, that uh, we've made in Fervio um, are that we want to use something called a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme. So uh, as I mentioned secret sharing before, the idea that um, end parties can split the secret among themselves. Um, the verifiable part of verifiable secret sharing is that everyone uh, can verify that their own uh, private key shares are valid. Um, they haven't been distributed in, in invalid uh, private key share by someone. Um, um, you know, if, if say there was a rogue validator uh, being part of the protocol, well, uh, you would want that their uh, messages can be detected by, uh, by um, the person receiving the messages. Um, but we go a little further than um, just a verifiable secret sharing scheme. Uh, we want to use a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme. Um, in a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme, uh, the validity of every step of the DKG can be checked by every other validator in the network. So um, uh, this means that um, the validators are going to engage in this key generation protocol and they're going to share messages with each other. Um, um, it's not just the recipient of each message that can verify um, that the, uh, the message was constructed properly. But in fact, um, every validator or even people who are not validators in the network uh, can check each step of the DKG, check each message and make sure that it's valid. And the reason that this is important in, in the uh, blockchain context is that there's no issues if a validator goes offline. So uh, um, the reason for this is that um, if the scheme was not publicly verifiable, um, then a validator that could 
send a you know rogue or invalid message um, might not be detected um, because uh, um, uh, uh, um, if the validator that's receiving that message has gone offline for some reason, um, either on purpose or uh, you know if they were if there was like a denial of service or something, or, or if there's just any issue that caused them to go offline, um, this invalid message might not be detected. And so um, uh, the distributed key generation gets much more complex um, when you have to have uh, additional rounds of communication where a validator has to be online and file a dispute uh, um, if, if, if uh, a different validator is acting. Um, in a malicious or, or Byzantine way. Okay. And so uh, our primary objective here is that we're going to avoid that. We want to avoid that as much as possible. We want to use a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme where um, if a validator goes offline, then they know that all of the messages that they would have received, uh, they were online, um, are, uh, are, are still good. Uh, let's see, we have a question. Uh, would it be possible to use a hierarchical uh, secret sharing scheme to account for the weights of each uh, validator and thus reduce the number of um, shares needed? Um, that's a good question. And it's one that, that we, we struggled with for, for quite a while ourselves, um, um, trying to figure this out and, and reading all of the literature about secret sharing. Um, so the answer, uh, the, 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 the short answer to this is that um, you can, but you don't necessarily gain very much. And the reason for this is that um, is actually kind of quite deep. Uh, um, secret sharing is an information theoretic um, construct. Uh, it's actually um, based off of polynomials and interpolation, right? Uh, if, you're f if you're familiar with secret sharing, um, is not actually based on like a cryptographic construction necessarily. And so the problem with information theoretic schemes is that um, you, you don't actually get many opportunities to, um, to do like compression or aggregation or, or anything like that. And so um, if you have a secret sharing scheme, which um, you want to have, you know, uh, parties have different weight in them, um, then very oftentimes um, uh, the, uh, the size of the private key share um, is going to be uh, um, is going to grow uh, with the weight rather than um, anything else. Uh, grow linearly with the weight, and so um, if you adopted a different uh, kind of um, secret sharing scheme, um, uh, for example, there's uh, secret sharing schemes that are not based off of polynomials; they're based off of like Chinese remainder theorem. Um, there's actually uh, many different secret sharing schemes that people have proposed, but uh, sort of a common thread among amongst them um, is that uh, uh, unfortunately, when you actually try to implement them, um, uh, it's very very difficult to sort of beat the uh, the simplest secret sharing scheme of, of sharing a, a polynomial uh, evaluations of a polynomial. Um, which uh, it's not to say you can't beat that, but uh, uh, certainly a simple scheme is very um, uh, much more straightforward to implement and optimize. Um, um, but uh, sort of uh, as uh, as we found, um, um, uh, we were able to get the secret sharing scheme to to be uh, very performant. It's just a it's mostly a matter of. Um, dealing with the high amount of bandwidth required uh, because of the high number of private key shares and um, also making sure that our implementations are all um, very fast computationally, algorithmically fast, um, this uh, big O of n log n uh, algorithmic complexity. Okay. Um, so the other uh, important property of our distributed key generation um, is that we actually use a synchronous on-chain message passing um, protocol. And uh, this is actually quite a bit different than most of the uh, academic literature on distributed key generation. 
Um, a lot of the interesting work in, in recent years has been on um, in the asynchronous model um, that is, uh, um, or, or uh, uh, maybe I should say a partially asynchronous model where um, um, entities are passing messages uh, uh, between each other, perhaps using a gossip protocol. And um, there it becomes much, much more difficult to achieve like a, a big O of N log N uh, overall complexity. Um, um, and, and also um, uh, maintain the synchrony of the network. You know, uh, synchronizing things in general is just a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, I mean, that's why blockchains are interesting. Um, but uh, uh, since we uh, have uh, control of the underlying chain, um, it's uh, actually much, much simpler if you uh, use the existing uh, BFT uh, consensus mechanism um, to uh, to synchronize your distributed key generation protocol. And it's just much simpler when the blockchain and BFT consensus are, are already there. And you can assume that when a message is posted to the blockchain that it can be received, that it actually is received by everyone. Um, and that there's not uh, uh, some kind of uh, Byzantine fault in the network. Um, now, this of course means that there's a lot of on-chain data, but uh, um, we find that this is not a problem uh, because this data is actually prunable later. And so we're not uh, carrying this data forever. So, um, um, so we're going to run our distributed key generation protocol on, on the chain. And, and we have uh, this nice, um, it's based on this nice publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme. Um, there's a technical issue which tri which tripped us up for, for, for quite a while, um, namely that um, um, a publicly verifiable secret sharing uh, based DKG uh, generates private key shares that are elliptic curve points and not scalars. So uh, if you're familiar with how private keys work, usually uh, you know, in elliptic curve cryptography, uh, private key shares are scalars and public key shares, uh, public keys are with the curve points. Uh, however, um, in the DKG that we constructed, um, the private key shares are also with the curve points. Um, formally speaking, um, um, this uh, DKG works over a uh, pairing based, uh, pairing friendly curve um, and the public key points are, uh, public keys are G1 points and the private keys are G2 points. Uh, the private key shares are G2 points as well. Um, and, and this is a problem uh, because you, uh, it becomes very difficult to use like existing um, uh, threshold uh, decryption schemes, um, which are not written with this assumption in mind. They're written with uh, perhaps other assumptions in mind. Um, and so our solution to this is uh, we've developed a new pairing based uh, 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 encryption scheme that supports threshold decryption with these publicly verifiable secret sharing uh, generated keys. Now, uh, just uh, one aside, um, there was a nice paper this year by uh, Groth, uh, the same Groth as in Groth 16, um, who uh, um, described a uh, PVSS based distributed key generator, uh, which actually does generate private key shares that are uh, scalars. However, um, uh, the scheme that uh, we're using is um, quite good enough, um, uh, quite high performance and um, um, uh, simple enough that um, we can we can continue using the um, PVSS scheme that uh, uh, um, has this uh, private key share uh, property. Okay, so uh, so what, what are the optimizations and features that are, are really interesting and, and perhaps unique uh, to, to Fervia? Um, first is that everything is being done using fast um, big O of n log n algebra operations. So uh, if you're familiar with um, of course, secret sharing in general, um, or perhaps uh, just inferring things from what I've said so far, um, secret sharing involves a lot of polynomial operations. Um, you know, multiplying, adding, uh, interpolating polynomials, evaluating polynomials. Um, there's a lot of these polynomial operations which which um, um, happen uh, in the secret sharing process and uh, in the threshold decryption process. 
and they're sometimes but not always optimizable using um, like FFT techniques. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, there's actually a, a quite general field of uh, um, fast polynomial operations, um, uh, fast polynomial algorithms, which, which allow you to do all these um, operations in the required n log n speed. And so uh, where we've had to, we've implemented all of these operations and um, you know, uh, integrated them into, into our distributed key generation and threshold description um, implementation. And so that's, that's going to allow us to uh, scale up the number of private key shares um, to the level that we want without uh, destroying the performance completely. Um, some optimizations um, that, uh, that we've done on the decryption share side, um, we have uh, in our implementation, one decryption share per transaction per validator, uh, not per transaction per private key share. So this is uh, a very, very nice optimization, uh, which um, our very own ZK Hack uh, host, uh, Kobe, helped uh, point out. Um, uh, and this is, this is very important because any time that you can do something on a per validator basis instead of a per private key share basis, um, you're automatically going to get an enormous speed up because you're going from, like I said, uh, 4,000 or 8,000 private key shares down to uh, you know, 100 validators. Um, uh, our, uh, threshold uh, our encryption and threshold decryption uh, scheme has to be um, something called key committing. Uh, namely, uh, we want to be able to say that either a transaction um, is guaranteed to be decryptable or it's detectable that it's invalid. Or another way of saying this is that all valid transactions um, um, can be decrypted. Um, using uh, verifiably decrypted using the key that we derive. And uh, the reason this is important is to prevent uh, the censorship of transactions. That is, you don't want validators decrypting a transaction and then discovering, oh, no, no, I didn't like this one. I want to censor it um, in some way. Uh, the, the important property we get from key committing is that um, if a transaction is validly constructed and encrypted, then um, the decryption shares will become available and it must become decrypted uh, because it, uh, uh, everyone else can, can verify that um, um, if, it was, if it actually was an invalid transaction, uh, that um, um, that fact is verifiable to everyone. So uh, before I, I hand this off to Joshua, uh, part which I know that everyone is going to be interested in, what is the actual concrete performance of this, of Fervio, um, both in terms of the bandwidth and the uh, uh, compute time. Um, so the uh, amount of data that goes on chain um, is, uh, is uh, for the distributed key generator is actually quite large. It's 138 megabytes per epoch. So if you uh, refresh your key, say, once per day, um, you're putting this large amount of data on the chain. However, the trade-off is that it's actually prunable. So it's more of an issue for uh, um, gossiping all of this data around. It's, it's not very efficient uh, to gossip the data while um, the DKG is running. Um, however, um, in terms of your long-term storage costs, it's actually not important because once the DKG is done and the epoch is passed and the key has expired, uh, you can just prune all of this data from, from your blockchain. And uh, if you do, if you, you know, have the ability to build your blockchain in a way where it's prunable, um, then you, uh, you maybe don't care so much that, that your DKG uses so much on-chain data. Um, and then the uh, um, actual data that, that sort of is important that, um, uh, on chain, um, the decryption share and the ciphertext overhead is going to be quite minimal. Um, your decryption shares are very, uh, very small amount. Um, um, so, you know, basically 48 bytes per transaction per validator. Um, and so um, maybe yeah, if you have a lot of validators, um, this can add up per transaction, but uh, as a general rule, it's actually very, very small. It's it's much better than if it was, uh, again, 
um, 48 bytes per transaction per private key share. And then the ciphertext overhead um, uh, from, from uh, um, encrypting to this uh, public key, a um, couple hundred bytes, uh, this is also mostly unavoidable. Performance-wise, a rough single core measurements on, on, on my laptop, and so uh, it should be much, uh, much better on, on actual um, like validator hardware. Um, we managed to uh, push most of the compute into a per block compute. Um, so it takes about four seconds of compute per block to do, um, to, to sort of uh, um, do all, all the prep work for, for doing threshold decryption for that block. And then a really insignificant 16 milliseconds extra compute per transaction. Um, uh, the the um, cost has been, a, uh, so if you have many transactions, you're actually amortizing this uh, four second cost of, over the many transactions um, in that block. Um, and so uh, even for a very high number of transactions, like 100 transactions per block, um, you still don't actually have that uh, very much total compute time. And um, you know, if you parallelize this uh, over many cores, if you have 32 or 64 cores, uh, you, you, uh, th this should um, make this uh, quite feasible for validators to do uh, over, um, um, you know, o over all of their blocks, right? Um, uh, you know, the, the, some validators might have to upgrade their hardware, but that's an acceptable trade-off against you know, running a proof of work uh, minor or something, right? Um, it's, it's, it's not that significant um, to, to, to add some more cores. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, you can check out all of our work in progress, uh, the uh, public repository. Certainly uh, appreciate any uh, comments or feedback or, or uh, other insights that you might have. Um, any, uh, any interest, any questions? see uh, share papers related to DKG or PVSS yes yeah, so a DKG in the wild is a great one um, um, there's uh, one that a lot in fact um, that, uh, that put us in contact with uh, um, you know Kobe about this in the first place um, um, on aggregate aggregatable DKG um, uh, in fact, uh, our, our DKG is very, very much closely related to uh, this aggregatable DKG, um, except, of course, the, um, the aggregatable DKG is more interesting overall in the asynchronous context um, where, where they, they get this uh, big O of N log N performance um, asynchronously, uh, um, which, is, which is a much bigger achievement. Um, the fact that we're doing everything synchronously makes things um, makes the, the full aggregatable DKG unnecessary, but uh, uh, in in every other respect, our DKG is very very similar to, to the aggregatable DKG. Um, maybe I'll. I'll uh, I'll share one more paper. Um, this is the uh, the Groth twenty one uh, DKG. Um, um, it's a very very interesting piece of work. Uh, the the um, uh, I, I encourage you to re to, to uh, at least read the abstract and 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 maybe uh, understand uh, uh, why it's an interesting piece of work. But um, certainly uh, uh, it's. Uh, also quite complex, um, both in, in concept and implementation. Okay. Um, I think so, that's a good slide time. But, uh, yeah, I think Josh, like, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I guess if there's any other questions, Joe, do you want to just kind of stick around in the chat if people wanted to ask more? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And Joshua, do you want to maybe jump in here. Joe, I think you're gonna have to yeah, turn sure. off your screen for him, for Joshua to share. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Perfect, cool. And I think when you're not speaking, maybe just mute to, to avoid any sort of background. Perfect, cool. 
Okay. Let's see, can I make this big? All right. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to present on uh, Plunk Up, uh, a, uh, a protocol which combines uh, both Plunk uh, and PLOOKUP protocols uh, into one. Um, this, uh, well, let me just find where I'm at here. Uh, so what is Plunk Up? Um, it's, a, it's a method for unifying the Plunk and Plunk Up proving schemes. Uh, Plunk uh, came up first, Plunk Up came out a bit later. Uh, there was nothing in, uh, in the, the Plunk Up uh, paper saying exactly how these two things could or should be combined. Uh, pl uh, Plookup was kind of its uh, own uh, singular thing. And so we, we went ahead and, and tried to uh, combine these uh, and uh, ended up with, uh, with Plonkup. Uh, Plonkup has the advantages of Plonk, which are uh, relatively small proofs, uh, fast verification, and uh, universal setup, uh, with the additional power of lookups to reduce circuit sizes if you have an unfriendly, a circuit unfriendly function like uh, uh, bitwise operations. Um, most, uh, most hash functions have some bitwise operations, so uh, implementing them in a circuit is a little um, uh, inefficient. Uh, but with lookups, you can, you can increase the efficiency a lot. Uh, the reinforced concrete hash is, a, is an example of uh, a, a new hash function that um, exploits lookups uh, and uh, arithmetic in a circuit. Uh, so to express the uh, reinforced concrete hash in a circuit, you need something that can do both. Uh, and plonk up is, uh, is our solution for doing both. Uh, we've uh, taken, um, we've been following the convention of uh, using the term Plonkish to refer to a family of protocols that descended from Plonk. Um, if you just say Plonk, no one knows what you're talking about because there's there's so many different kinds. So uh, if we're referring to the family of protocols, we just call them Plonkish so that people know we're, we're talking about a whole, uh, whole group of, of protocols that have some similarities. I think it was uh, some folks at ECC that started using Plonkish as uh, in this way. Uh, so some examples of Plonkish protocols are Plonk, the original, uh, Turbo Plonk, and Ultra Plonk, which I always get confused which one is which. But one is referring to custom gates, one is referring to uh, lookup gates, and possibly also custom gates. Uh, like I said, I forget what's what. Um, pluck up. Uh, which is for lookups only, plunk up, which is our uh, our version of uh, lookups and arithmetic. Um, Halo two, which uh, uses uh, plunk um, with a different polynomial commitment scheme, and for flunk, which uh, just came out, and also this is the first time I'm ever pronouncing that out loud. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe you're plunk here someday. Uh, it's, there's so many different plonks. Uh, everyone should try and make their own plonk, I think. It's a good exercise. Okay, so uh, what characterizes a plonkish protocol? Um, they can't be characterized by their polynomial commitment scheme or their gate structure because you can change those. Uh, you can swap out uh, the polynomial commitment scheme um, you can use uh, you can use KZG or Kate commitments. Uh, Halo two uses uh, an inner product argument like bulletproof style commitment scheme, uh, but you could theoretically swap it out and use uh, something like Fry, um, turning Plonk into a kind of Stark. Um, so you you can't really uh, call something Plonkish just by its polynomial commitment scheme. Or the gate structure because uh, you can use custom gates, um, so uh, which which can be basically anything. So, uh, what does characterize a Plonkish protocol? Uh, you have fixed width gates, uh, which could be custom. Uh, you have a universal setup, 
So you can run one trusted setup that works for any circuit below a particular size. Uh, Plonkish protocols usually exploit uh, a Lagrange basis in order to, um, uh, to gain some efficiency there. So uh, in a Lagrange basis, you, uh, you represent your values by uh, points or evaluations on polynomials rather than coefficients or, or some other thing. Um, and they have a grand product argument. Uh, the original Planck uses a grand product argument to, uh, to show that there's a permutation of, uh, of variables that shows their equality. Uh, Plookup has a different product argument. Uh, Planckup combines those. Uh, I just see a question here. What's uh, fixed with gates? Uh, with uh, with Planck, you don't get uh, unbounded fan in um, like you do with uh, rank one constraint system. With R1CS, you can do basically unbounded additions in a single gate. With uh, with Planck or Planckish protocols, uh, you uh, you don't get to do unbounded addition. You could you could make your gate have many additions if you wanted. You could make it have eight additions, if you wanted, uh, but uh, it's it's fixed. Um, so I like to view uh, Plunkish protocols like a switchboard. Uh, so what I have here is um, is kind of my my mental image of of what's going on with Planck. Uh, I've got three different uh, types of gates here. We have addition in green, multiplication in blue, and lookup in orange. Uh, for A, B, C, and D, A1, B1, C1, D1, to be a part of this, uh, this green uh, row means that they have to satisfy a particular uh, constraint in this case, an addition constraint. So I decided to make it uh, A plus B equals C plus D. Uh, multiplication, uh, A times B equals C plus D. And for lookups, uh, then uh, you just look up the, the tuple A, B, C, D, and check to see if it's in the, uh, the table. All right. so. Uh, Rows are associated with uh, these these gates. They need to satisfy these gate constraints. All right. Uh, then what you can do is uh, connect them together. I, I hastily drew these uh, wires on an airplane. So, um, but uh, you could uh, plug a, a a kind of patch cable in and connect two variables. So here I've got C1 and A2 connected, which means they need to take on the same value. That's how you can connect variables from one uh, gate to another gate. Uh, so here I've got a multiplication gate where one of the factors in the multiplication, B4, also needs to be uh, a part of this, uh, this lookup. So it's going to be the first element in this lookup. So C1 equals A2, B4 equals A5. Uh, before I get too far, I just wanted to give uh, some terminology uh, so you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, wires are columns of the prover's private inputs to the circuit, and they're vectors of length n. So if I scroll back up, here. I'll try not to do too much scrolling. But if I scroll back up here, uh, you'll see I've got A, B, C, and D columns. So we have four wires, the A wire, B wire, C wire, D wire. Uh, and the length of those wires is six. Okay. Gates, talked about a little bit, but a gate is just a relationship that a row of the priver, prover's private inputs must satisfy. And uh, Plonkup supports arithmetic gates and lookup gates. Uh, sometimes these are also called constraints. 
Um, sometimes if I'm really being bad, I might call it a row, but it's not really a row. So, um, but you might hear that. Uh, selectors are vectors uh, also of length n that turn gates on and off. For example, a one index k of the lookup selector turns the lookup requirement on for row k. Um, a selector can also contribute an auxiliary scalar to a gate constraint in some cases. Like I said, they're vectors of length n. Uh, finally, we have uh, copy constraints. I've already mentioned these. These are like those, uh, those patch cables that you can plug into the uh, switchboard um, that force two variables to take on the same value. Um, so these are used to build a permutation which swaps each variable with another that is supposed to be equal to it. So essentially, uh, we run through the same kind of product twice, one with the um, original value and one with the permuted value. Uh, and if those products are equal, then the original value and the permuted value must be the same. And we also have a circuit description. This is uh, uh, all the stuff, selectors, circuit length, and the permutation encoding the copy constraints and the lookup table form the circuit description. This is, uh, this is public stuff that uh, you need to, uh, to prove and, and verify a circuit. Uh, okay. Here's what our uh, lookup table will look like. Uh, the lookup table has columns equal to the number of wires in the circuit. So I had four wires earlier, so I, I made a table with four columns. Um, and uh, we will uh, take those values of wires in a lookup gate and see if those same four values appear in, as a row in this table. Let me do a look up. Okay. Uh, there are, I, I, I made a lot of slides. I made way more slides than I needed. So I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, or not all of them in depth. Uh, so uh, you, can, uh, you can see these slides. You can take a look at them later if you want to look at more of these arguments. Um, but I will stop here for the grand product argument. This is what I was talking about before, where we, uh, we check these copy constraints. So what we have is uh, four wires, A, B, C, and D. And we multiply up all of these terms into a big product. And uh, if you look at the numerator and denominator of these terms, they're they're similar, but not quite the same. Uh, up top, you have, can I highlight that part? Not really. Uh, right here, you have like I beta. I stands for the index of the original uh, value. Um, so uh, the we index these like uh, basically the first wire, A, gets uh, 1 through N. B gets... Uh, n plus 1 to 2n, right, um, and so on. So we have uh, we have all these indices from 1 to 4n. Uh, that's what i is here. And uh, in the denominator, we have almost the exact same thing, except we now use the permutation on the index instead of the original index. Um, so if these... Uh, if the product in the numerator equals the product in the denominator, they should all cancel out and you get one. Uh, if you try to mess with any of the values of the wires, it's not going to cancel out, you won't get one. If you try to mess with the indexes, it also is not gonna cancel out. Okay. Uh, Plookup also has a product argument. Uh, this I should say is a modified version of the lookup uh, product argument. Um, we, we've changed this a little bit to, uh, to make it more um, efficient. 
this suggestion here um, for how to change this was uh, 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 Luke Pearson came up with this. Uh, it really, really helped with the um, the efficiency of our of our Plunkett protocol. Um, Plunkett also has this product. This is really interesting, I think. So I, I'll I'll try to explain how it works. Uh, you have a um, a vector of queries, which is f, and you have a vector uh, that comes from the public lookup table, that's t. And uh, you combine those together, you concatenate them to form a new vector s, which is double the length of uh, either t or f because you're combining them together. And then you divide s into two halves. Uh, which we call H1 and H2. And you can see those down here in the denominator. Uh, H1 are all the odd uh, indexed uh, elements of S. H2 are the even indexed elements of S. And uh, S is sorted to match the ordering on T. Okay. So uh, what happens here is that these uh, denominator factors will run through all of the elements of S. And you can actually see here, if you look, we are not just going through the elements, we're kind of pairing up adjacent elements so that we have, we have a first element and we have the next element, which is multiplied by delta. Um, so all of the, uh, the pairs of elements as you go through S are, are, are run through uh, with these denominator factors. If uh, that pair of elements that are adjacent matches a pair of elements from the table, then one of these denominator factors is going to cancel with this factor here. Uh, sometimes the two uh, adjacent values will be the same. Uh, when they're the same, they are the same because uh, they are uh, a table value and a lookup value, uh, which means the, the excuse me, the uh, table value and a query value, I should say, which means the query is in the table. And uh, that's why we see it twice. We have a table value and a query value. They're the same. Uh, when that happens, if, if these two, like H1i and H2i are equal, then you can factor out one plus delta because uh, we also see this one plus delta here. The one plus delta can come completely out of this. And what you have left is epsilon times the, uh, the single value, uh, which must be one of the queries, which is F. So uh, that will cancel out with these factors here. So as we run through this, uh, this concatenated and sorted vector here, S, it's either going to cancel out with an element of the table or an element of the queries uh, if the uh, vector is formed correctly. So this will all cancel out and you get one. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip past some of this more technical stuff, uh, and I'll I'll show you these uh, gate structures before we get on to the live coding part. Uh, with Plunkup, we have two uh, major kinds of gates. We have arithmetic gates and lookup gates. Uh, here's an arithmetic gate. What you have are uh, the prover's private inputs. These are A, B, C, and D. Uh, you also have selectors, uh, QM, QL, R, O. Uh, we couldn't figure out a name for the fourth one, so we just call it the fourth one, Q4. And QC is a constant that you can uh, add into a gate. So uh, if you look here, this first term has QM times AB. Uh, so if the Q selector, the QM selector is a one, then that means we are including uh, A times B in this gate as a part of the constraint. Um, 
if that selector is zero, then you won't have that in there. So um, if you if you turn on QM with a, with a one, you make this a, a multiplication gate. Um, or you can turn it off and make it more of an addition gate. Uh, the rest of the terms, we have QL, QR times A and B each. Oh, and also QO times C. Uh, these stand for left, right, and out. Um, so these can scale A, B, and C, or they can turn them off completely by making them zero. Uh, we have a fourth one uh, for, for D, um, and we have a constant also. So uh, this is more expressive in some ways than a rank one constraint. Um, uh, actually, I'd take that back. I'd take that back completely, as this is all addition here. Uh, a rank one constraint can uh, also express this with also even more additions if they want. Um, so this is less expressive than a rank one constraint, um, but it can do multiplication and uh, and scalarized uh, addition here. So kind of like a linear type constraint with with one multiplication. Uh, a lookup gate is, uh, is much simpler. It doesn't have to satisfy a formula like this. All it needs is that that tuple needs to be an element of the table. OK. So uh, if you want to use Plunkup, uh, you, uh, you can run a setup with Plunkup. Uh, here we have the code for this. Um, N is the, uh, the size of the circuit that you want to use. Um, and uh, so you can generate a, a setup this way. This is uh, your trusted setup you may have heard about. Uh, then uh, we create a prover. A prover can have a uh, kind of a tag. I'm calling this one workshop prover. Uh, this um, initializes uh, a transcript. Uh, so workshop prover is also kind of a diversifier so that different proofs for different purposes will have uh, different tags here and will not be able to, uh, they won't verify uh, if you have the wrong um, tag. Uh, all right. Then uh, the prover has private inputs. Uh, my, uh, my circuit here, I should have put a slide on this, but my circuit here is uh, showing a Pythagorean relationship between private inputs. So uh, there's three private inputs, A, B, and C, and my circuit should show that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So here's the uh, prover's private inputs, um, 5, 12, and 13. That should form a Pythagorean triple, if I remember my geometry correctly. And these are added as inputs and become variables in our constraint system. Uh, the prover.mutecs is our constraint system. All right, once we have variables in, we need to put our uh, gates into the circuit. Uh, we have uh, a multiplication gate here, and it has uh, a selector value, which is one, and uh, it's two variables, A and A. So this should... Uh, give uh, one times a times a, so a squared. And then we save that here in var a squared. Var b squared, essentially the same, just we're using var b. Of course, var c squared, essentially the same, we're using var c. Um, then we need one addition gate to show that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, the way we actually do that is show that a squared plus b squared uh, plus c squared equals zero, uh, or excuse me, minus c squared equals zero. Uh, so we have our three squares. Uh, we could scale those if we wanted to, but we don't want to in this case. So we're just using a one. And uh, for c, uh, we take the negative so that it adds to zero. All right, once we have our gates, uh, then you can prove a circuit uh, with a commit key CK. Uh, you just run uh, prover.prove, and uh, that will create your proof for you. 
And then to verify, uh, you need a commit key and a verifier key. Uh, but you just run verifier.verify. And uh, that takes proof, verifier key, and some public information here, the public inputs and the lookup table. And gives you your result. Um, I think I saw some interesting questions over here. Uh, David, what's the point of reordering T in T prime as well uh, from enabling alternative ordering slide? Uh, I will uh, scroll and see if I can find that slide. This is one of the slides I skipped. Um, We, uh, we have to sort these vectors. And uh, sorting can be kind of tricky. Uh, they need to be sorted um, in order for this uh, lookup argument to work. Uh, but uh, the prover needs to sort their copy of the table the same way the uh, verifier has their copy of the table. Um, so you can use uh, like a relative uh, sorting algorithm, or uh, you could also just do this uh, small change to the product argument here. Uh, the prover um, uses this T prime instead, which is their own ordering. Uh, it can be whatever order the prover wants. It doesn't have to match the prove the uh, the verifier's copy, which is T. Uh, and these extra factors show that the prover's uh, ordering is a permutation of the verifier's ordering. Uh, so this enables the the prover to choose a sorting algorithm of their choice. Um, if you use a relative sorting algorithm, it's um, it's a little tricky. Uh, if you uh, take one of uh, any any number of efficient sorting algorithms out of the box, you can get down to n log n uh, pretty easily um, just by attacking on a few extra elements here. Uh, we had a, a, an issue with the sorting when we first ran through this protocol, the sorting was was really destroying our, uh, our, our benchmarks. Um, and uh, this, uh, this allows you to kind of step around that issue. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. Okay. Uh, I think if, um, uh, are there any questions over the slides before I switch over to the live coding part? Uh, I don't see any new questions in Q and A. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, and switch over now to the the live um, live coding. Uh, I kind of gave you a a preview in uh, in some of the later slides. Uh, the uh, syntax is going to be slightly different because I'm using a slightly different uh, version of our of our library. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Okay. Uh, so what I'd like to do here for the live coding portion is. Uh, show you how to use uh, plonk up to uh, make an XOR table. Uh, XOR is a, you know, it's a pretty common uh, operation in hash functions. It's also not that easy to do with um, uh, regular arithmetic gates. Uh, the main reason is that you have to, uh, to break up the XOR uh, into a bunch of little pieces, um, often just bits. Uh, so if you have a 256-bit element and you want to XOR that with a, some other 256-bit element, well, you have to uh, break that into, into bits and constrain each bit so that you know it's a bit. Um, so you end up with 512 constraints. 
then you have to uh, use a constraint for each uh, uh, XOR. Uh, and then you need to collect all of those uh, back together into the, your output. So because uh, you're working bit by bit, um, you end up with you end up using a ton of constraints. Uh, if you use a, a lookup table, you can uh, work more easily with multiple bits. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, make a, a four-bit lookup table. So uh, each input is going to be four bits, um, and that'll that'll save a lot of constraints. Uh, we're just going to uh, do an XOR between uh, two bytes. Uh, I wanted to make sure this was not too uh, too complicated, or else uh, I'll be making too many mistakes on the screen here. Uh, so we're going to take a, a left value, a left byte, a right byte, um, XOR them together with our table, produce an out byte. Uh, Sorry, um, Ayazid, uh, I don't have a repo for you. OK, so let me uh, explain the different parts here. You've seen some of this already in the slides. Uh, here's our main. Um, N is the, uh, the size of the circuit. Uh, actually, it's bigger than the size of the circuit. It's the next power of two, larger than the circuit. Uh, this size needs to be a power of two in order to make the uh, uh, FFTs more efficient. So uh, once we have the size of the circuit, we can generate parameters. Uh, this is your, uh, your trusted setup here. So this will generate enough uh, elements in the setup uh, to handle a circuit of size 512. Next, we have the, the prover's viewpoint here in this, uh, in this closure. Uh, the prover is going to generate uh, random bytes here, um, three random bytes, uh, or two random bytes, I suppose. The last one is the XOR between the, uh, the left and the right. These are going to serve as the inputs to the prover circuit. Um, then the prover can create their, uh, their prover struct. I've got it tagged as ZKHack Workshop. Next, we will create the uh, lookup table uh, with this function. We're going to fill in that function, uh, which was uh, just above. Uh, next, we add the gates to the circuit. Um, we're also going to fill that in in a function that's above. Um, we create a commit key, which we need to do a proof. Uh, we do some pre-processing on the circuit. Usually pre-processing is done once per circuit. Uh, here, we're just going to do it on the fly. Uh, then uh, we also want to make sure that the, the verifier gets the same public inputs and the same lookup table. So we're going to, uh, to grab these from the prover's constraint system and uh, pass that along to the verifier later. Uh, and uh, then we'll create our proof. All right. Uh, once we have the proof created, uh, if you look at the beginning of this closure, uh, this will spit out a proof, the public inputs, and the lookup table. These two are, are public. Uh, well, all this is public. Um, and uh, the verifier will use these, this information to, uh, to verify. So the verifier also creates their own verifier. This verifier needs to have the same exact uh, tag here, ZK Hack Workshop. Um, the verifier uh, appends the lookup table uh, attaches their circuit. This is going to be the same circuit uh, using the same function. If you notice here, uh, these are the verifiers' inputs to the circuit. They can be anything. Um, I just picked some random numbers. Uh, I don't think that 7XOR2 is one, but 
I didn't I didn't really check. I just picked some things. Uh, those don't matter actually. Um, so then uh, we compute the uh, commit and verifier key, uh, and verifier does their own pre-processing, uh, and uh, then we can uh, run this verification here. Okay. Uh, and then we'll, we'll see at the end if the uh, verifier accepts. So what we really need to do is uh, fill in these two functions, um, generate XOR lookup table for bit and example circuit. Uh, both approver and verifier use both of these to create the circuit. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I have my cheat guide. Uh, okay, so to generate the table, uh, we'll just use some for loops. Uh, these are going to run through all four bits, so it's just going to go from 0 to 16. Uh, I is going to be the, the values in our first column. J will be the value in our column. And uh, we'll have our composer. This uh, is passed into this function. The standard composer handles uh, creating a circuit. So the composer has a uh, lookup table attached to it. Uh, the lookup table is just a, uh, a wrapper around a vector. So to get to that vector, I'm, I'm using the dot zero here. And uh, we will push a row of values. So our row of values uh, is a row of scalars. We'll use uh, BLS scalar. And uh, use I here. Uh, we need to pass a U64, so uh, we'll cast that to 64. Second value is from J. Third value is X or Y and J. Uh, this uh, this version of, uh, of the library basically defaults to a, a table that has four columns. We're only using three columns. Uh, so in the last column, we'll just, uh, just get it zero. OK, uh, and that should do it. Uh, this lookup table could be generated by anyone. It could be generated by the prover. It can be generated by the verifier. It can be published somewhere, uh, downloaded, uh, whatever. Uh, as long as prover and verifier agree what the table is supposed to be, uh, XOR, then, uh, then they can generate this table. Okay. So there's our, our code that generates our lookup table. Um, let's continue. Now we need our circuit. So here we will put in the gates and any, any computations that we need to do in order to, uh, to fill in those gates. So one thing we need to do is, uh, is take our left, right, and out inputs and uh, split them into uh, four-bit chunks. Uh, as our lookup table is uh, is based on four bit chunks, so uh, this is just a bit of arithmetic. Um, do this. We'll split in each piece into a high and low part. And create a scalar. Um, 
for the, the for the high bits, we'll just take the left uh, input and uh, do an integer division by 16. And uh, we need to cast that as uh, U64. So yeah, this integer division, that'll, that'll get you the, the four high bits. If you want the four low bits, do almost the same thing, except you uh, switch this to odd. So uh, there we get our high bits and our low bits, and uh, this converts them into a, a scalar. So we'll do this with all three. So now our, uh, our three byte inputs are split into uh, scalars that correspond to their upper and lower bits. Okay, now we're going to, uh, to include these as variables into our circuit. So we take our composer and uh, add input. Uh, do that. Uh, left high, that should do it. Oh, um, this will take the, the scalar and turn it into a variable. I want to be able to refer to the variable later, so I should probably. So oh, uh, our scalar input will turn into a variable in the composer. And uh, we need to do this with all six pieces. Absurd that I'm typing in front of a bunch of people. If I uh, failed typing in school. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Hello. These need to be changed to. Okay. All right, uh, looks good. Uh, there's one more variable we need, which is um, after we do these uh, these XORs, uh, we're going to have the out. Uh, bits and the, the out high bits and the out low bits, we want to combine those back together into um, the uh, out variable here. So we'll also include Out to U8, so we'll, we will need to uh, convert that into a scalar. Okay. There's all the variables we're using. Um, next, we can add the gates. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, we're going to use uh, two lookup gates, one for the high parts, one for the low parts. XOR is really nice for this because you can do XOR in, um, you can divide things up into pieces and do XOR on all, on all pieces and then compose them later. Okay, so we pick our composer and uh, do a plug up gate. Uh, start with our high variables. So, um, as I said, uh, this version defaults to a width four table, um, but the, the fourth element may or may not be there, so um, we need to wrap it in a sum. Uh, and this needs to be a zero. So there is a zero variable that comes up along with the composer that you can use in this case. So that's really just an empty column. We're not using. So put a zero in there. And there's one more input that we need. Uh, this is a, uh, a public input, which we're not going to use. So uh, we'll just. So uh, let me label these. This is A, B, C, B. E. So uh, we are looking up this tuple uh, in the table, and then this last one here is uh, public input. Hi. Um, you may, in some cases, uh, use a public input to specify a particular table that you'd like to use. We only have one, so we, we don't need that. OK, so this is uh, going to check the XOR relationship between the high variables. Uh, we have to give the out high variable. Uh, so we have to compute this ourselves and, uh, and put it in here. And this, this gate checks the relationship between them. Um, in this case, it doesn't compute the output for you. Although we do have some, uh, some arithmetic gates that do work like that. All right. And we'll do the same thing with the low side. zero that's still going to be zero so I think that's good for our lookup gates so uh, this checks that um, the high bits actually XOR up to out high and the low bits actually XOR up to out low but then we need to combine those back together and check them against our, uh, our out here uh, which is also encapsulated in this variable out var. So we need one more gate. Uh, this is just going to be an addition gate. Um, we're going to kind of reverse the uh, this decomposition that we did up here, where we split things into upper and lower. So all we're going to do is uh, take the, the upper bits for out, out high var, and multiply them by 16, and uh, that'll give us uh, four zeros in the lower bits, and then we just add out var low, or out, out low var, um, to get back to uh, eight bits. So this is an add gate. And we're taking the uh, out high bar, out low bar, and the 
out as far as inputs. Uh, we want to make sure that our constraint um, has that 16 times the high var plus the low var equals the out var. Um, going to be our multiplier on the high bar. I'll label all these later just like I did these. Okay. This is going to be our coefficient multiplier on low var. This will be our coefficient multiplier on the out var. It needs to be one, but because we're trying to constrain these to be equal to one another, uh, or all add up to zero, rather, uh, we need to make it negative. Uh, then we have two more scalars that we can put in. Um, but we're not using these really, so we'll just zero. And uh, yeah, let me label these for you so you can see what they are. Um, you can see, and then uh, these are selectors. This is the QL selector that modifies A. This is the QR selector, which modifies B. Not very much modifying because it's one. Uh, and we have the QL selector. No, I already did that. QO selector. This is a constant, you see. Um, most of our gates, you can add in a constant as well. And uh, this is public input. Not really easy. Uh, Uh, David asks, what's the D here? Uh, this particular style of gate uh, is written to uh, to just have three inputs. So it just automatically puts in zeros for D. Um, we have uh, multiple versions of these arithmetic gates. Some are uh, some allow you to set every single variable in that, that long constraint. Some are more focused, so we're if you only need uh, three inputs, you can just use the three input version. So, yeah, D is the fourth one, uh, but David asked. OK. Uh, let's see. Um, will that do it? I think that will do it. So we just have three gates in our circuit, uh, two lookup gates, which compute the XOR, and uh, one addition gate, which uh, repacks those uh, those four-bit chunks back together into an eight-bit uh, byte. OK. So uh, if I've done this right and I haven't made any mistakes, we should be able to run this. Um, we'll see. Uh, let's see. So I'll uh, bring exhibit plunk up. Um, do a cargo on release and uh, hey, can you see that? Yeah, it worked. So it uh, goes through the, the steps, generating parameters. It's a trusted setup, pre-processing, -pre uh, then creates the proof. Uh, the verifier does their own pre-processing. Verifier does their verification, and proof is accepted. Um, so uh, the proof was accepted because our inputs really did uh, correspond to um, XORs and the gates here. Here's where we got our inputs. Left and rights were, were random. But then we uh, we did the XOR between left and right to get our out. And um, so uh, it should work, and it did. But what if I mess this up a little bit? 
and epsilon just add a plus one. Um, then this should not verify. And I, I, actually, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, okay. Now, we'll, oh, make sure save it first before you compile. Okay. Uh, so what happened here is uh, we had a panic. Uh, we tried to unwrap um, error value. Uh, said element is not indexed. Uh, this happened while we were creating the proof. Um, so what happened here is the prover, uh, in, in our implementation, the prover checks as they're creating the proof that their, their lookup uh, queries are well formed and, uh, and actually exist in the table. Um, so this is the prover saying that they're not going to uh, create a proof. They're going to quit because uh, they know it's not possible um, because uh, one of these one of these values was not in the table. Okay. Um, it is theoretically possible for a prover to uh, to ignore this, try to create a proof anyway. Um, if that were if that would have happened, uh, instead of getting an error value here, we would have, uh, the proof would just have failed to verify. Um, so this stopped actually before that verification actually took place. Um, another way I could mess this up is uh, mess with these scalars here. So what if I put two instead of one? Um, and save. Uh, our our inputs should not satisfy this gate. The XORs will be done correctly, but when um, packing them back together to make a the, the out byte, uh, it shouldn't work because the uh, the lower bytes are going to be multiplied by two. Uh, so this should not verify. Let's check it out. Aha. So now you can see the proof was rejected um, because uh, our, our inputs did not satisfy um, this last gate. I'll back. All right, uh, in the interest of time, I kind of uh, skipped past some things that you probably would want to do if you were actually uh, designing a circuit. Uh, I only ever checked that the out uh, the out byte is formed from those upper and lower uh, bits here with this last add gate. Uh, the inputs left and right were never checked. Um, so, this decomposition where they're split into high and low, uh, this is never checked in this circuit. Uh, if you were really doing this, you probably would want to uh, to constrain those or, or check that that um, that the the left inputs actually correspond to the high and low that we say they do here. Uh, this computation is not done in the circuit. This is just the prover's own like private computations. They can do however they want. So there's nothing. Uh, forcing them to actually decompose these inputs correctly. Um, only the outputs uh, are constrained with that last gate. Um, but this actually kind of corresponds to a lot of normal use cases because uh, often you have inputs to a circuit or a portion of a circuit that are outputs from a, a earlier parts. And so they might be constrained in earlier sections. Uh, so I kind of was thinking of that scenario when I uh, was, was practicing this example circuit. But it wouldn't be too hard. I'm not going to do it now. But it wouldn't be too hard to uh, add checks on left and right the same way that we have them here for out uh, just by copying and pasting this. Uh, all, all I'd have to do is change the uh, outs to left and right. It should work. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, are there any questions over um, any of this uh, this live coding part? Any uh, questions about the gates or uh, 
questions about why I did certain things. Joseph says, great demo. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, a little bit more for questions. In case someone is uh, thinking hard and tapping a question, I'll uh, just say some uh, more remarks on this, uh, this repo. The one that I'm using for this exhibit uh, is uh, a little bit out of date. Um, it was the easiest just to get up and running for, for, this, um, for this exhibit. Uh, but our, uh, our best version of this is, uh, is located at, uh, uh, it's called ARCPLONK, A-R-K-PLONK. Uh, and it, it uses the uh, ARCWORKS backend. Um, if you've been doing some of the ZK hacks, uh, you've probably already seen ArcWorks and know a little bit about it. I think there was a presentation on it. Uh, so yeah, we, we're porting this library over to, uh, to ArcPlonk. And um, we'll let, I'll just uh, give you the uh, up here. Uh, Rust ZKP uh, slash ArcPlonk. Uh, the library is not complete yet. Uh, we're working on it, um, but it's uh, it's actually a little nicer than this one that I'm using here. Very cool. 